John, are you ready? Okay. Ready? All right. Uh, thank you all for coming and sorry for the delay in getting started. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Percy Menzies today to our talk. He is the president of Assisted Recovery Centers of America, a center for the treatment of alcoholism and drug addiction based in St. Louis, Missouri, which was established in 2001. Percy's interest and passion for pharmacological treatment of drug addiction and alcoholism goes back to the early 80s when naltrexone was first introduced for the treatment of heroin addiction. He worked for over 18 years for DuPont Pharmaceuticals in various positions and had responsibility for naltrexone as an associate product director. He has worked closely with drug courts and provided training on the use of anti-craving medications to reduce recidivism within the criminal justice population addicted to alcohol and opioids. He has conducted workshops for a wide range of audiences, both in the US and overseas on evidence-based treatments for addictive disorders. He has been invited to serve in expert committees to develop guidelines for the treatment of addictive disorders and alcoholism. He has been invited to serve on advisory boards, both in the private and the government sectors. Uh, Percy holds a master's degree in pharmacy from India and he migrated from India uh, to the United States in 1977. Um, I want to thank the business school, nursing, and also the Koch Foundation for making this uh, presentation possible. And just one announcement before I bring up Percy, uh, please put your phones on silence. Um, thank you. Uh, please join me in welcoming Percy Menzies. Thank you, Dr. Felder. It's a pleasure to be here, but let me start with the disappointment. Then to ask questions, but we have time after the talk that we can interact and so on. You are all nursing students, and many of you probably don't have as much exposure on the pharmacology of addictive disorders. But believe me, when you go back to practicing, whether you are on the med surge, you are in ER, anywhere else, alcoholism and drug addiction is a common denominator. You're going to be encountering these patients not necessarily saying I have a problem with alcohol or drugs, but from the, subs, from the consequences of the alcohol or drug use. So it makes sense for you to learn more about what this is. And I'm going to start with some of the history part of it. And, and you'll know, this will give you an idea why we are in such a bad state. Did can anyone guess in this room how many people last year died of a drug overdose? Anybody want to take a guess? Go ahead. There are no wrong answers. Can anybody take a guess? In the US, in the US, anyone? Uh, that's a little too high, 93,000. Last year in 2020, 93,000 people died of a drug overdose, the highest in the history of this nation. And another 90,000 died from alcoholism. Now, if any other disorder had given this, you know, had caused these many deaths, all hell would have broken loose. There would be, there would be demonstrations in the cities and against the uh, city hall, something has to be done. We are just passively throwing our hands up and saying nothing can be done. That has to end. Okay. I came into this field from a very different doorway. I'm not in recovery. Uh, I have a background in science, uh, pharmacy, and I used to be an instructor in pharmacology. I worked for a small pharmaceutical company that was later acquired by DuPont. So I tell people I come from evil pharma. Okay. But what our company did was, was amazing. They developed a range of pain medications from opium, your oxycodone, your hydrocodone, oxymorphone, which have caused all the problems, but not 40 years ago. They also discovered a most amazing medication called naloxone, 
Narcan. How many of you have heard about Narcan? Everyone. Do you know how old the drug is? Probably older than most of you in this room, except for a few of us. It's a drug that was approved by the FDA in 1971, and it was introduced. They said, what are we going to do with this drug? We have no use for it. It went into the, on a shelf, just sitting there. So this is the state we are in. And then we developed, based on the pharmacology of, nal of naloxone, they developed a drug called naltrexone, which probably most of you have not heard about it. That was the first non-opioid drug introduced for the treatment of, to, to prevent people from relapsing. So we'll go into these uh, slides here. And, um... okay. Can anyone guess what this is? This is a slide here. Can you tell me what is common in this slide? If you have the, if you get the right answer, you have free lunch with Dr. Bose. He'll take you out for lunch. Can anyone take a guess? Every one of these medications on this list were supposed to be cures for alcoholism. Beer, there was a medication that was, um, that was considered the gold standard. It was called double chloride of gold. This is before the FDA was formed. And in those days, you could put anything on in a bottle without, without revealing the ingredients. It was called the patent medications. So there was no FDA. So this guy was, was peddling this as double chloride of gold, and that was supposed to be the cure. People rushed to get it. They got shots of it, and they swore they were cured. You know, what did it contain? H2O. That's the power of the placebo. So you saw all this happening. They, they, they came up with another cure saying that if you can use carbon dioxide, so they would actually put a helmet on the patient, an alcoholic patient, a helmet, and pump carbon dioxide and throw them and make them comatose and then wake them up. If the poor guy woke up, then he was supposed to be cured. So you see, all these things have been used over the years as cures. And that is the backlash even today we are facing because of what happened in the past. Why, you don't get, why, why is it that you don't get studies on, on addiction treatment? Because we have made sure that addiction is outside the mainstream of medicine. It is tragic, but that's the situation we are in. Name this drug. There is no longer any doubt that for the first time in history, a substance and methods have been found to halt or control the drinking of the toughest alcoholics known. This was a bold prediction made by two very well-known researchers at UCLA and at Harvard. Can you guess which drug they were referring to? LSD. They thought that LSD would cure alcoholism. When, they, when, they, when samples were sent to them by this uh, Swiss company and see what happened. So, so much so that the founder of AA, Bill Wilson, he's considered almost like a saint among the people in recovery. Bill Wilson himself was struggling. He founded AA, but all his life he struggled and he tried to self-medicate his cravings by excessive coffee drinking excessive smoking and sexual behavior. Okay. So he was struggling. So when they said, the scientists said that we have found a cure for alcoholism, he says, I want it. And he went on this. He took LSD himself. And when his disciples or his followers were aghast at this, this was his response. The path to recovery are many. But the practice of addiction treatment they only want you to take a very, very narrow and probably not a very effective path. So he himself knew that something, a science that someday would come up with, with treatments that would help people. And he was willing to take that step. Unfortunately, the present orthodoxy does not allow that. So they have a vested interest in not going and going and looking for newer treatments and so on. So let's go with this. This is the problem with addictive disorders. 
unlike many of the medical conditions that you are dealing with, whether it is diabetes or it is asthma, hypertension, cancer, you know what the etiology is. There's endless speculation on the cause of addiction. There's no clear consensus. Is it a biological disease? Some of us will argue, yes. Is it a characterological disease? Is it because these people have a weak character or a bad character? Okay. Is there a moral or spiritual failing? We are quick to point a finger saying, you have, a, you are, you have got bad morals. You're not a spiritual person. You have given up on religion. That is why you are now worshiping alcohol. Things of that sort. Is medical intervention helpful? I will argue in my talk that yes, it is extremely helpful and almost indispensable. But yet there are groups who believe that addiction should not be treated through a medical model. There are, nine, there are 23 million people in this country, 23 million who are affected by drugs and alcohol. Less than 10% receive medical treatment. It is shocking. If we had any other chronic condition that was so poorly treated, was outside of medicine, there would have been a lot of issues there. But here, nothing. Okay? And stigma and shame. And I will argue in the point that stigma and shame, the way we try to remove it, is just not going to work. So let's go to this. We have a very dark history of um, past treatment. And we are being haunted by that. What we did in the past is still being used over and over again to keep people from really accessing the tremendous progress we have made in the understanding of neuro, the neurobiology of addictions and, the, and also the behavioral therapies. We had eugenics. Did you know that in the, till about 1963, close to 60,000 people, 60,000 women were forcibly sterilized as a way to prevent them from passing on the alcoholic genes. It's unbelievable. So have, we have water therapy. People are given massive doses of water to clear their system of the alcoholic genes. Convulsive therapy, psychosurgery, they had frontal lobotomies as a way to end their alcoholism. Inebriate asylums. Nobody wants to have an alcoholic patient in their house. Let's put them away. Let's put them on some island somewhere and forget about that. So we call the asylums, miracle and fraudulent cures, which we have talked about that, morphine maintenance clinics. We have tried so many things, but what we have not tried is giving science a foothold, giving science the opportunity to help people. Look at the history of it. So we have used dependence-producing medications as cures, because when you give somebody an addicting drug, then it, that because there's reciprocity, there's a reciprocity to that, you think you are cured. So somebody who's addicted to vodka or rum or, or uh, whiskey, you give them beer, the symptoms seem to become less. But then you have another problem that, that because our beer after all contains alcohol. It was very common in the past to treat uh, addiction to distilled spirits with beer, because beer was supposed to be an innocuous drug, innocuous food item that had no downside to it. That's what happened. Opium and morphine for alcoholism. It was very commonly used to treat, alcoholism was treated with, with opium, because opium and the derivative of from opium, you know, from opium, the active ingredient in opium is morphine. Morphine was a cure-all for everything. And the abuse that occurred was unbelievable. LSD to treat alcoholism, benzodiazepines to treat alcoholism. You may not know, but they thought that alcoholism is caused by the body inherently producing less uh, uh, GABA. It is one of the neurotransmitters. So anything that increases GABA levels would help them. And we've got alcoholic patients horribly addicted to benzos. Heroin to treat morphine addiction, methadone to treat opiate addiction, buprenorphine to treat. Some of these have has some clinical validity, but it cannot be the only treatment. So this is what we see, that there is a propensity to use addicting drugs as cures to maintain them. And that is one path, but it cannot be the only path. 
definition of an of a dependence producing drug it causes a euphoric high you get you get euphoria or you get a high so if you give them a, a mild drug there is a mild stimulant they get a high and people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol they're always looking for the high but they have because of tolerance they have undergone so much damage to their receptors and to the brain that they are constantly looking to get the high in a different way because of the brain damage so when people who are addicted to alcohol and drugs they continue to use alcohol and drugs not because they're looking for a high because they just want to feel less bad the pleasure is far gone now they are just there to just get through the day habit forming and addicting abuse potential tolerance there was all these things have happened but because we did not understand the neurobiology of addictions in the past we thought these were cures and we ended up doing more harm than good for the patients so that's the history that we are carrying on our shoulders why dependent producing drugs because it is easy to use them you give somebody a person who is addicted give them one of these drugs and they say oh my goodness this is fantastic i'm feeling fine i'm cured i don't need anything more i'll just stay on it but then you have the other problem that just keeps developing in sometimes you will have to use these medications don't get me wrong but that cannot be the only treatment option for patients we have a long history of using highly addicting drugs we thought drugs like morphine and cocaine so cocaine was considered by people like uh, sigmund freud as the greatest gift that uh, god gave human mankind we thought so cocaine was for everything and you know what some of you heard that what did what was the famous drink that had cocaine in it coca cola they thought it was there and they realized the, the challenges with that so coca coca cola syrup had cocaine in it because they say you know this is an amazing thing from this 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 is from the leaves of these coca plants i just put a little bit of it and it's going to be amazing it just is going to fortify you is going to stimulate you is going to make you feel good about it we can see cocaine tooth drop these were the good old days that even kids could have cocaine tooth drop you know you know tooth drops our life is our life is pretty boring these days you know look at the how happy the kids look so we have so many ads because those days there was no fda there was no control on these drugs anything went anything went there's a guy who came up with a pretty good idea why not just fortify wine with a little bit of cocaine in it and look at how cheerful the guy looks you know ready to this what happened and so much so that even he had one of the popes bless this you know give his uh, endorsement to this wine you fortify wine with cocaine and believe me you have a you have a winning formula a winning recipe <laughs> we had same thing with the other drugs like morphine opium opium was one of the most abused drugs in history because when they discovered opium and later on the active ingredient in opium called morphine you had a lot of happiness so this is you know paragoric and they have this you know you have um, you could even give it to a 5 day old child you know a drug opium that was dissolved in alcohol you give it to babies because we didn't know anything better so we thought these were all cures and this is this went on it was very commonly used soothing syrup mr winslow soothing syrup all you do is give them the, you know it was called baby it's called gripe water give the baby this alcoholic you know this syrup that was it was nothing but 45% alcohol and how cheerful the baby is sorry so this is how students in you know, so york the students of the past they really sort of relaxed before taking a test by smoking opium so those were the good old days and look at you you get you guys what do you do before you take a test certainly not smoke opium but this is what they were doing sorry and then this is this is an interesting a story about it so in the in the 1800s okay a big problem was coughs people were hacking away because of several things number one cause was tuberculosis 
and the other was pneumonias because they had no treatments for that. So people were just hacking away. So everybody, everybody was trying to find an industrial strength cough suppressant because they, this coughs had to be controlled. So they were playing with it. They found that you know morphine was a huge problem. So this German company Bayer was trying to develop um, a super heavy duty pain medication. I mean, super heavy duty cough, cough suppressant. And lo and behold, they came up with this medication that they say is the holy grail. This is going to cause, this is going to be the cure for coughs. And so much so that they called it heroin. Heroin comes from the German word herosh, means strong or brave. So they've started promoting heroin to suppress cough. And interestingly enough, there were, there were, you know, there were physicians who gave it to some patients who had tuberculosis and they were also morphine addicts. Although morphine is a very strong cough suppressant, but this was, they were still having breakthrough coughs. So they gave, these doctors gave them, uh, gave these morphine addicts heroin to control their cough. And you know what happened? Can anyone take a guess? The cravings for morphine disappeared. <laughs> So these were people who were morphine addicts that would take it several times a day. They gave them heroin. And they said, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I have no cravings for heroin. Oh, sorry, I have no cravings for morphine. And they said, we have found the holy grail to treat morphine addiction. So they started promoting heroin as a cure for morphine addiction. And you know what happened? Because what is, what is heroin? Heroin is nothing but two molecules of morphine joined together chemically. So technically, heroin is diacetylmorphine. Two, morph two morphine molecules joined together with an acetyl group. That's it. So we find, so when it goes into the brain, it dissociates and gives you a double whammy, gives you a double jolt. So after about 20 years of using it, they realize that the cure is worse than the disease. So this is the history we are dealing with. Benzodiazepines. this was uh, amphetamines, were very commonly used. They were, when you took an airplane ride for your, uh, for your seasickness, motion sickness, the standard treatment was amphetamines. Now we don't even get pretzels on the flights. In those days, those were the good old days where you got benzodrine uh, when you boarded a flight. So they thought amphetamines were, were a cure for many, many disorders. So we have producing drugs that are still in clinical use and we have to still use them. Don't get me wrong. They have a very important place in treatment, but they cannot be the only medications. Methadone is very commonly used. You probably know it was developed as a pain medication by the Germans. You heard about buprenorphine, okay? The brand name is called Suboxone or Subutex. It also is an opioid drug. It belongs to a class called mixed agonist or agonist antagonist. We have LAM, which is not currently used. LAM is a long acting form of methadone. So instead of giving methadone every day, you give it um, three times a week. But there was a lot of issues with that and they stopped using it. Benzodiazepines. We don't maintain patients on alcohol. We don't maintain alcoholic patients on benzos but this is a very, very important medication to detox people of alcohol. I'm sure you have studied about the use of benzos to treat alcohol, you know, to, uh, to detox alcoholics. Very important because when, when you are dealing with alcoholism, the big fear is what? What is the biggest uh, danger of people be withdrawing from alcohol? Anyone know that? What's the biggest risk factor who people who are withdrawing from alcohol. Seizures, very good. Okay. So you have to take him out for lunch, sir. Okay. It's seizures. And there's another serious condition called DTs, delirium tremens. So alcohol withdrawal is a very risky proposition. It doesn't, it's not an issue with alcohol, it does, it's not an issue with opiate addiction. But when you are dealing, when you are detoxing a patient with alcohol use disorder, 
you need to use benzos to help them. Nicotine patches, gums, barbiturates, we don't use them anymore because they're a very dangerous class of drugs. Some people still use them. They all have you know, roles to play, but, but then we have used them only as the only treatment. And that's where the challenge is. Okay. So what are the consequences? I showed you all these slides. What led to this? What are the consequences of the past? The first one, the first one is distrust of science and medical community. It is sad that these 90% of the people with the alcohol or drug addiction treatment do not see a physician or a nurse practitioner because there is a group that, is, that has complete distrust of the medical community. I've seen people, who say, I've met people who say, I don't want to go you know, to see a doctor because they are practicing medicine and I don't want them to practice on me. That's the situation we are dealing with, okay? Pharmacophobia, alcoholism, we don't need alcohol for, to, treat, to treat alcoholism. You don't need any medical intervention. All you need is giving yourself to a higher power and that's it. So those are the things, that's the legacy we are dealing with. Pharmacohegemony, I call it, because if you are addicted to opioids, there's prescription opioids or it's illegal opioids like heroin or fentanyl, they say the only treatment is methadone or buprenorphine. They don't make any attempt to, to give patients a chance or giving them other medications. So I call it the domination of opiate substitution treatment, OST, to treat addiction to opioids. The other challenge that we face is a domination of people in recovery. Our field, unfortunately, is dominated by people in recovery. That includes many physicians, nurses, social workers, therapists, and so on. So when I go to give talks, quite often I'm asked the question, are you in recovery? And when I say no, there's almost a look saying, why are you here? If you're not in recovery, you don't need to be here. So we have to change that na narrative and say that we come from the field of science. So when all of you now, when you graduate, and when you have the understanding of what is the neurobiology of addiction, addictive disorders, you can gently help some of these colleagues of yours to say, hey, you know what? There's enough evidence that medical approach works splendidly. It can change. And it is important to, to teach the new generation of nurses and physicians. That's when I go to medical schools. I ask uh, the young physicians, how many of you want to go into addiction medicine? How many hands go up? Zero. I ask people in nursing schools, how many of you want to go into addiction medicine? It is not even on the radar. They want to go to med surge and they want to be flight nurses and they want to be, go to ER and things of that sort. But addiction treatment is rarely seen as a viable option for people in the medical field. It is a, important. And I hope at the end of the talk and when you ask some questions, you'll consider this as an important. At my clinic in St. Louis, we have something like uh, 18 nurses and nurse practitioners. And we are desperately looking for at least three to four more who can help patients. So there is, a, there is a also the lack of parity with, medical Ill, with mental illness, continued stigma for the disease and some treatments like methadone. Because, you know, the very nature of methadone but there is, you know, some people need it, but there's a very strong bias against using methadone. Stigma, why the stigma? You know, how often you hear that, you know, if you can, why is this, med, why is this disorder, uh, why is addiction so stigmatized? There's a reason for that. I actually have a whole talk only on stigma because of the unsocial and criminal behavior. How many people are proud of their friend or their family member who has an alcohol problem? And with addictive disorder, especially with opium, they have to almost indulge in criminal behavior to obtain their drug. And that is unacceptable society. Embarrassment to self and family, free will issues. How often we say, you, have, you did it on your own. You had no business using drugs and alcohol. And now you suffer the consequence. 
but not one person I know who has told me that I was determined to become an alcoholic. I was determined to be a drug addict. Drug addiction always happens accidentally. They did not know that they had the genes that they were predisposed to alcoholism or drug addiction. They didn't know that. One thing led to the other. So voluntary process now becomes involuntary. But society is unforgiving. The society will say, you had no business. That's why it's a free will issue. You, you use drugs on our own, quit drugs on our own too. It's easier said than done. Because once the addiction takes over, it's, it, it's exceedingly difficult to get off without any kind of uh, intervention. Some people do it, but they are the rare exceptions. Moral spiritual failing. You know, no personal responsibility and repeated treatment failures. This is the only field where the failure is blamed on the patient. There are family members who will take a second or third mortgage, send them to these fancy places in California and Arizona for 30 days, 60 days, pay $40,000, $50,000. And the patient comes on the way back home, they get drunk at the airport, at the airport lounge. And who's, whose fault it is? The patient's fault. The treatment center never takes responsibility for what happened. If you, were, if you were a cardiologist or you were a neurologist and the patient had a second heart attack or something happened, you are responsible. You have to take them back and treat them, but not here. So we have a, we have a system that is extremely good about blaming somebody else except making the, making the attempt to change and incorporate the advances in the field that have occurred. That's the sad part of it. So repeated treatment failures also is now dumped on the patient. Stigma, it's at everywhere. Patients, family, friends, the medical community. As I told you, I asked how many of you want to go into this field, not interested. I you know, talk to, sometimes when I go to give talks in, uh, at uh, Grand Round Stocks, and I said, why, what, what are you doing to help these patients? Nothing. So the media has no interest, except if it's a very dramatic story. But when we talk about addiction treatment is very low tech and quote to, sorry to say, not very sexy to treat. It's very low tech. It's not, it's not like, you know, putting them on in a, in a, in a, uh, in an OR and then having um, all these, uh, you know, 10 physicians treating them. Do, do, low uh, opiate treatment, alcohol treatment is very low tech and majority of the patients can be treated on an outpatient basis, but that is not interesting for the media. Media wants to see something very melodramatic, right? Pharmacies. Pharmacists have a big role to play, but they have not really got involved with it because says, I don't want to get involved with, with people with addictive disorders. I don't want these patients to walk into my pharmacy because they steal, they do all these things. I don't want them. I have physicians I try to say, I said, would you want to come and work for me? What do you do? Alcohol and drug addiction. Oh, sorry, not interested. Because these patients are not reliable. They lie to you. They, 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 they smell, things of that sort. But that's the nature of the disorder. The, the disorder almost requires that you lie, cheat, steal, sell your body to use the drug. Because when you are in a survival mode, remember human beings are created to thrive. Addiction throws you into a survival mode. When you're in a survival mode, there are no rules of engagement. Whatever it takes to survive, I'll do it. So our goal is to understand what has happened to them. And our goal is not just give them um, a, a pill, but help them to regain, go back to, to, a, to a thriving mode. Think about reinverting Maslow's pyramid because survival mode is the most dangerous mode for a human being to be in. And yet we leave them in that, in that survival mode for years and years, because we are saying nothing can be done. This is an incurable disorder. So you see all that at every step, you can see those uh, things happening. This is one of the most fascinating stories that, that you're, I'm going to tell you about. Okay? And this is the development of non-addicting medications 
to treat addictions. So they said that why can't we, so this is in the 1930s until about early 1960s. So they came up with a brilliant plan. So they would take opioid heroin addicts from St. Louis and from Chicago and from Philadelphia and send them to this place in Lexington, Kentucky. This was a huge, it was called the treatment farm. And they were there for anywhere from three months to six months of treatment. And during that time, there was a huge sprawling campus. So they got lots and lots of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. And over a period of time, they said, this is amazing. The addiction was cured. They had no thoughts about it. They didn't talk about addiction. They just stayed with that, uh, what you call it, at this place. And they said, this is what you call it. This is amazing. When you take them away from the natural environment, keep them in a healthy wholesome environment, like what they were doing at, at Lexington, this is gone. The addiction is cured. Okay? So patients reported no cravings, desires, or thoughts for drugs. Both patients and the therapists consider the treatment a success. So now this is the answer. Just like we try to treat uh, people with tuberculosis, send them to what are called TB sanatoriums, right? This is years ago. So let them breathe fresh air and eat some healthy food, exercise, and the TB will be cured. So this, they had a similar approach at Lexington. Isolate them away from the drug-seeking behavior and environment, and they're going to be cured. What they saw was, was, a, was, a, was totally baffling. The relapse rates were extremely high. Within hours or days of coming back home to the natural environment, but they're coming back to St. Louis or Chicago or Philadelphia, they relapsed. And patients experienced symptoms similar to acute withdrawal despite being drug-free for three to six months. So imagine they were coming back on a Greyhound bus. And as they were coming back home, something happened in their brain and they started having symptoms identical to active withdrawal. This was completely baffling and most of them relapsed. Just coming back home. Does it sound familiar? Yes, we all know that. Right? Failure completely baffled and disappointed researchers. So the researchers said, all our work has gone down the drain. What's wrong with what? What happened? So this is one of the most famous quotes. Dr. Abraham Wickler is called the father of cravings. He did incredible work at Lexington, really understanding what the, the, the neurobiology of craving. He made a prophetic quote saying, Psychotherapy and psychoanalysis are complete failures in the treatment of addictive disorder in the treatment of addictions because there are forces at work that neither the therapist nor the patient is aware of. So neither the therapist or the patient is aware of what is happening. And what are those forces? It is called conditioned abstinence syndrome. You force somebody into an abstinence mode, you isolate them, put them into prison. The, the addiction does not go away. It goes into hiding. So he called, the, it is, he called it a new condition, sui generis. So once the addiction has occurred, it becomes permanently hardwired in your brain, in your memory, in your emotions, in your motivation. It sits there. And when the right environment occurs, it really explodes like a volcano. Caused by the addiction getting in, embedded into the memory, emotional, and motivation through neurocircuitry changes will last a lifetime and the major cause of relapse. Indeed, if you are dealing with a patient in an inpatient unit or in an inpatient setting, whether it's, whether it's, whether it's in, the, in the criminal justice system, in prisons or jails, residential programs, you have to ask yourself the question, what have I done to protect the patients when they go back into the lion's den. Because if you send them without any protection, they have a 100% chance of relapsing within 30 to 60 days. So what did they do? They came up with the thing that says, obviously the present treatment they were offering that time was not working. We cannot just send them on methadone because methadone is very addicting. And I'll rush through this thing. So they said, can we develop a non-addicting medication that protects patients? It acts like a seat belt around their brain. It acts like a Teflon coating around the receptor sites to protect them when they come back home. Okay? And they had 
discovered another drug I told you earlier, naloxone. So based on the chemistry of naloxone, they developed this medication uh, and that was, it was highly effective and the drug was Naltrex. Now you have probably not heard about this medication because never in the field of medicine, two drugs at the opposite spectrum, methadone and naltrexone, were offered for the same treatment. And you can imagine the tension that was there and the fights that broke out. Which way do we go? Do you go with an agonist like methadone or do we go with an antagonist? So that's where the challenge occurred. So that's why naltrexone is a, again, again, a very old drug. It was approved in 1984. It is virtually unknown. And alcohol and naltrexone, you probably also know, is also effective for the treatment of alcoholism. So I want, I'll, I'll just very briefly mention the three classes of groups, groups of drugs that come from the opium. One is called agonists. So they occupy and activate the opiate receptors. So these drugs are heroin, methadone, oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl. They all are agonist drugs. So they go and bind with the opiate receptors and activate them. And activate, the, and activate the receptors fully so they get they experience analgesia, sedation, but they also experience high. And high is what leads to, leads to tolerance and ultimately to addiction. So agonist drugs are very addicting if used long term. They are, they are fantastic drugs for short term use. Antagonists, on the other hand, as the word suggests, will occupy the receptor and completely block it. It's like a key is a, a, a lock that has been completely shut down. Nothing happens. So once you give them an antagonist drug like, nal like nal naloxone or naltrexone or nalmefine, there's no activity. So once they occupy the opiate receptor, nothing happens. And more importantly, the medication naltrexone will not allow the entry or will not allow the, the agonist to occupy the opiate receptor. And then you have the drug called partial agonists. So they will only partially activate the opiate receptors. And the drug that is most popularly used is buprenorphine. So it's important to know when you talk about opium chemistry or opioid chemistry, these three groups are very important to have a good understanding. Because how you use these medications is going to depend, you know, it's, it's going to make an impact on the patients. When you activate, I told you, it causes analgesia, euphoria, cough suppression, cough center suppression, breathing suppression. So opiates are notorious for, for suppressing the breathing. So what kills people when they overdose on an opioid is the cessation of breathing because the opiate, is the opiate will paralyze the respiratory center in the medulla oblongata, and then they will not be able to breathe. Okay, that kills them. So all these are very common um, side effects you see. So this is what we are dealing with. The stronger the analgesia, the stronger the addiction. So codeine is a relatively weak analgesic. That's why the addiction to codeine is not as strong. But fentanyl or heroin, fentanyl is a very powerful analgesic. And therefore, the addiction to fentanyl is also very strong. And now the major killer of people in this country is fentanyl or drugs laced with fentanyl, because fentanyl is so strong that we actually measure that in micrograms, okay? This is what happens. So the, if euphoria cannot be dealing from the addiction, that's what happens. So this is the challenge we face and scientists are relentlessly attempting to change that, but nobody has succeeded. Drugs with high opiate receptor are, are heroin, morphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl. They have a very strong affinity for the opiate receptor. And once they bind with them, you have a very, very intense release of, uh, you have a very intense, uh, the patient experienced a lot of analgesia, but also the euphoria and the high are the problems. Definition of a non-addicting drug, no euphoria or high. To a patient, this is not attractive. A, patient, a drug is not giving them a high and the drug is not very attractive because remember, patients with an, with an addictive disorder want a high. They're looking for a high. So it takes quite a bit of effort on your, on your part to get them to change that, okay? If they don't cause tolerance, they're non-habit forming, non-abusable, but 
they are not attractive to the patient. So to start a patient on a non-opioid drug is a challenge, but well worth the challenge because it is really rewarding down the line. Clinical issues with dependence producing drugs. Okay, the problem is that, you know, we always joke saying when you give them a, 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 a dependence producing drug, what happens? The dog eats it. They run out of it. Right? This is what happens. So you, this, you saw this what happened in the, 90, in, the eight, in, the, in the 1990s and early 2000s with prescription opioids. We made an absolute mess by promoting prescription opioids for chronic pain. And nobody knew what chronic pain was. So chronic pain was very, very subjective, right? And that's what created a problem. So you have to be very careful in prescribing an, a dependent producing drug. So if you're prescribing methadone, how is methadone given to patients in a clinic form? They have to go to the clinic, stand in line every morning to take it. Because if the patient got a month's supply of methadone, in all likelihood, they'll probably use it in a few days and could overdose. Same thing with buprenorphine. So you have to be very careful with that. Okay? So there is, when you're using, uh, this is of course, a non, this is non-dependence producing drugs. So when you're using a drug like naltrexone, you have to be very careful. Uh, you have to be mindful that they will not take it. It's like giving a kid a choice of either uh, Coca-Cola Coca -Cola or bottled water. <laughs> what are they going to take? Probably the Coca-Cola. Because water doesn't, you know, it's not very attractive. But to get them to use, to get them to drink water, is 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 it takes some task on the part of the therapist, the nurses to help them. So as nursing students, you have a role to play when they are really coming to you, or seeing them. You can explain to them the different how these medications work and how it might be appropriate to stay on a medication like naltrexone, because the compliance is very very poor. If you give them a prescription for naltrexone, very likely they'll not take it because they don't want, they don't, they, they want the high. And if you give them a month's supply of buprenorphine or methadone, they'll probably take it on in a few days. So that's the challenge we face in our field. So these are the, so the future is non-addicting medications because we know that if a drug is addicting, it's a major side effect. And the pharmaceutical industry researchers are striving at their, to come up with newer drugs that are non-addicting. But that's also challenging to use because there's a constant fight between those who believe that addicting drugs are the only way to go and those who believe that, no, we should be very hesitant or we should be restrained in using addicting drugs. So these are the partial list. And all these presentations are available to you online. I'm also very good about responding to emails. So you have my contact information here. If there are questions you have, you want to have anything, please contact us. Because our goal is to really educate the new generation of nurses and physicians on these medications. Because we cannot accept such a high number of people dying. It simply is. And the sad part of it is that it's a treatable illness. I can understand for something completely incurable. These are very treatable illnesses. All we need to do is learn, for, learn about the medications, develop a passion to helping people. And some of these are used when, and are used in, um, uh, in medicine, right? They're all um, approved by the, by the FDA. A campresid is, is called Camprel. It's an effective medication to prevent people from relapsing to alcohol use. Bupropion, it's an antidepressant is used to us in smoking cessation. And now it is also found to be effective to treat meth. So when you combine bupropion with naltrexone, it's an effective treatment to treat uh, meth addiction. So there are, these are all medications that have a role to play. And yet we are hesitant. 90% of the 23 million people do not have the benefit of any of these medications because physicians are loath to accept it that it's a curable disorder. And that has to change. So there is a lot to learn from what happened, especially from the failure of Naltrex. And I won't go into the details of it, but we have to be open-minded and be ready to accept 
that there are that we understand the neurobiology of addictions there are different ways of of skinning the cat not just one way and once you are open to that and you start educating the patients and the families you'll be surprised how things can change there are of course there are other critical factors cost of medications but you know when we were dealing with serious conditions whether it was hiv aids it was hepatitis c we never considered the cost we only focused on one thing keeping people alive and getting them well just look at what happened with aids 35 37 years ago we did not even know how aids how aids occurs because it was a complete shock to us in less than 35 years we have developed over 30 new medications in six different classes to the point that if you are hiv positive it is no more a death sentence look at the phenomenal progress we achieved in the battle against uh, aids and hiv look at the progress we achieved in the, in fighting covid and so many other disorders why why the problem with addictive disorders why are we so hesitant to learn about it even at the height of the aids epidemic we did not have as many people die as what we are seeing on a yearly basis of people dying from alcoholism and drug overdose so i will um, there were a lot of benefits you can you have an access to these uh, uh, to these slides so much needs to be done i'm really really sort of disappointed that medical schools nursing schools hardly teach about addictive disorders why i don't understand there of course there a lot of issues that happen in residency training in schools of social work a lot of social workers are told you really don't need to understand medications you just focus on the behavioral aspects no you need both because 1 plus 1 makes 3 that's important so working with existing treatment centers hospital because too often the problem is i'm in recovery i know it all this is how i got well and this is how you are going to get well it absolutely drives me crazy when i hear that from uh, from so from, from social workers or peer support specialists who constantly talk about their own recovery without making an attempt to understand the progress science has made okay so this is my contact information we have got a few minutes to talk about any questions concerns whether you agree with this please feel you're all in a you know, we're all a group of friends here so don't hesitate to ask any questions no you cannot you cannot combine that's something you that said in an altrex so the question was can you combine buprenorphine or suboxone with naltrexone okay and the answer is no now do you know what is the formulation of suboxone what does suboxone contain suboxone is a combination of two medications buprenorphine which is a partial agonist and it contains the opiate reversal drug naloxone narcan now why did they why did they add naloxone to the formulation can anyone guess why did they add naloxone to the buprenorphine formulation because buprenorphine is a very abusable drug so what patients were doing is they would get a script for nalt they would take get a script for some, uh, buprenorphine make a slurry out of it and will inject it now if you if you do that with suboxone the naloxone will throw you into withdrawal okay so naloxone will throw you into withdrawal and naloxone is only effective if it is taken as through a nasal spray or if it is injected but if you swallow it as prescribed it does not get absorbed and then you have the effects of the buprenorphine without any effect without any antagonist effect but you cannot use naltrexone even there's a small amount of opioid in the system so you have to be off opioids for 3 to 5 days before you can use naltrexone because naltrexone is an amazing drug but it's also very unforgiving if you have opioids it'll throw you into severe withdrawal just like naloxone does the difference is that naloxone's half life is only 30 minutes and naltrexone's half life is 24 hours so you'll be very unhappy for about 24 hours good question any other question comments 
Yes, ma'am. Good question. Is there, uh, do they have genes? Is there somebody has, a, has an addictive personality? My, my response is that the personality really follows the addiction. It's not the other way around. Okay. So some people are inherently risk-taking. Why do we have such a big problem with alcoholism and opioid addiction today? What do you think is the reason? Why do we have such a huge problem with alcoholism and opiate addiction. Exactly, boy, you should really make sure that you get a three martini lunch with Dr. Feller. You know? so, yeah, so it is, it is access. If the drug is everywhere, okay, then there are people are going to use it. And some people who have a genetic predisposition will probably start using more of it and ultimately become addicted. Now, there are enough studies that have shown that if you take about a hundred people and start offering them opioids on a regular basis or alcohol on a regular basis, about 10 to 15% cannot stop using alcohol or opioids. But the 85% can walk off. And that's the reason that the 85% doesn't understand what's wrong with this 15% minority. So we immediately condemn them, we stigmatize them, and so on. So yeah, the, so access is a major issue. So every one that you learn of a, a phenomenal success in, in reducing smoking cessation. How did we succeed? By reducing access to cigarettes. No more vending machines, no more the increase of price. So if the price is high and the access is low, then the addiction just goes, goes away. Unfortunately, this time around, we have no strategy to reduce the access to opioids and the price is becoming lower and lower, especially with fentanyl. Fentanyl is so easy to make you don't have to grow it in a field. You can make it in the lab. And one kilogram of, uh, of um, you know, fentanyl can be incredibly profitable. So that's the challenge we have. So we have to use different strategies to prevent people from using drugs. It's a talk for another time, but good question. Yes, Matt. You know, we can, um, we'll have to go to a lounge and talk about that. So people have talked about recreational marijuana. So I, I'm indifferent to it. I personally don't, uh, what do you call it, endorse it. But the, the horse is out of the barn. Okay? What happens with anything that is, that is recreational marijuana? It affects poor people disproportionately. Okay? It's just like saying, what is wrong with the, um, with casinos and legal gambling. It affects poor people disproportionately. And the well-to-do people can get treatment and put their lives back together. It's the poor people that pay, they get the short end of the stick. Look at our prisons and jails. They are not filled with the PhDs and MDs in lab coats. They're filled with poor people, mostly from the poor communities. So that's my concern about this thing. So same thing with smoking. You know, we saw smoking, very high incidence of smoking among poor people. The well-to-do people got the message. But who are the residuals today? Who is the, who is the group of people that are still involved in smoking? Are the less educated, the poor people? So that's my reason that, you know, legalizing that is an issue, that I'm not in favor of that. It's just sad. And now there's a whole new movement called harm reduction. And they are saying that focus on the, on the harm, not the high. Let people, what's wrong in legalizing heroin and marijuana, sorry, and uh, cocaine and uh, every drug? Because, you know, once you start legalizing, people lose interest in that. It is just the opposite. Because unfortunately, once you legalize something, it becomes big business. And big business is the biggest problem we are running into. Look at what is happening with legalized marijuana. Any questions? Any other questions? Good, good questions. So I'm here for a little while, and if you have any questions, concerns, of course, thank you for the for your patience as we got everything set up. But things worked out well. It was a pleasure meeting you and uh, and talking to you. And you have my contact information. Anything you want to learn? Any references? Holler.
because the more educated you are on this on this topic this issue the better you're going to help your patients thank you <laughs>